welcome. You're welcome. Oga Guy Fogodo is a lawyer. He's a poet. He's a writer, among other things. Of course, uh, he's here to tell us, fill, fill in the gaps, right? Yes. Is there anything I've missed out on? No, not so far. Not so far. Yeah. So you're welcome. Thank you. And it's been a very, 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 very long time. I'm sure some people would see you now. I'm like, where have you been? Yeah, um, well, I, don't, I think for some people, 14 years is an awfully long time, but that's how long I've been away. I always felt I was stealing time from literature to read law. So after all the days of uh, human rights, uh, June 12, and finally we had some kind of civilian government that we could all, you know, live with, I thought it was time to scratch that itch. So I went to the United States uh, for graduate studies in literature. Most people will do it the other way a degree first in English and then in law. In my case, law first and then English, literature. So I started with um, a foot in through a Master of Fine Art in Poetry at Cornell University in New York, upstate New York. And then after that, I felt I might as well be hung for a sheep as for a lamb. So I decided to go ahead and enroll in a PhD, which as you know, takes a few years <laughs> in the U.S. Uh, when I was done with that, I started teaching at Texas State University, which was where I was until last year. I could no longer resist the siren call of home and decided to come back home. So now I'm actually in the process of relocating. I've not fully relocated, but I'm back for good. That's a very, 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 very exciting word coming from you. Back for good. Because my take is, if we have these things here, if we have substance here, why give it to them? Why, give, why, why sell it out? Why not explore the potential that we have here? I mean, human resource, we have uh, capital resources like that, and then they're all there bettering, I'll use the word bettering other nations while our own nation is in... You know, it rocks. Well, it's just said and done. I mean, most people I know, especially in that uh, decade of 80s, 90s, uh, defined by the brain drain, most of the people who went abroad, they didn't do it willingly. In fact, uh, my teacher and a very well-known scholar, Professor Biodun J. Ifo, popularly known as BJ, has a famous uh, take on that. that. They would go abroad uh, in what they call two years in the first instance, you know, to see how things will go and hoping that they'll be back, you know, two years, three years after. Maybe things might have been straightened out a little bit at home and home is now more conducive towards uh, intellectual work. But they were two years, the first instance, and it becomes five years and before you know it, they are doing yes. ten years, you know, and so on. So when you say all these resources are here, that's not a problem. Nobody doubts that. Nigeria is probably one of the most uh, resource uh, yeah, resource endowed country to the point where you could even say our problem is what they call the resource cost, you know, where you are, it's such a bounty, you don't know what to do with it. So all that happens is basically just quantum mania and uh, waste. But I tell you, as many, uh, there are many people who think like me and who will take the next flight home if they could be sure that they could at least pursue a reasonable, humane, uh, uh, existence here. Yeah. When you bring a university teacher back home, what's he going to do? How much are you going to pay him? How is he going, you know, to uh, navigate all the things you have to navigate in Nigeria? Be your own water resources, uh, water board, be your own NEPA, be your own uh, s uh, security, you know, literally a local municipal government unto yourself. How many people can afford that, you know? So they always think of this, and then they delay the coming back. So, okay, next year, the year after, until. I'm sure quite a number know. of people will be wondering why you left in the first place. Well, um, probably I'm a masochist, you know. I, I don't know, but all I know is that I felt it was time to come home. What I, one thing I was sure of, I didn't want to work till retirement in the United States. I wanted to be back home so that uh, I could be part of 
what I was already part of. I mean, even while I was there, I kept writing my columns, you know, trying to contribute to the, uh, to shaping opinion here as much as my voice could carry, join with others and hope that uh, at some point it will gather enough momentum to bring about change. But there's only so much you can do while you are uh, across a big pond, you know, thousands of kilometers away. I felt the need to be back to more directly be involved as I had been before in the uh, struggle for change. When you say how you have been before, mm -hmm. what exactly do you mean? I mean, for the young ones who are coming up, who really don't know much about you? Well, I mean, I, I consider it the proudest part of my life, you know, my career, that I was always involved right from the university as a student leader. And that when I left the university, I was uh, very active in the human rights and what became known as the human rights and pro-democracy, you know, movement. I was always involved in that. Uh, so, and for those who at least know the history of that period, they know the extent to which I was involved. I just meant that being away all this time, I felt a certain remove, and I was always chafing at the beat, you know, as it were, you know, I need to be there. And there were street protests, I said, I need to be there. You know, we need to change this country. But uh, there's only so much you can do when you're abroad, just shouting across the water. Your voice will not be heard Very that loud. strongly, you know. Yeah. So uh, that, that was why. And I, and I really know, I know that a lot of people, I, I mean, it's a mass movement usually, social change, you know, were involved in their own different ways. It doesn't always have to be street protest, you know. So I, I just wanted to be more directly involved. Oh, okay. Again. In that case, um, I think it's only proper for us to roll back to how Ogagai Fawodo all, you know, unraveled. Let's start from the very start. Like we unraveled. Am I yes. unraveled? <laughs> <laughs> you are. No. You are evolving. You yeah. are transforming. You are, you are everything. You are okay. a bit of everything. So we'll get there. We'll get there. The name itself suggests that you're from Delta State. No, that's right. Okay, so what part of Delta State are you from? I'm Isoko, precisely. You're Isoko. Can you do us uh, the honors of uh, maybe saying one or two words in Isoko to convince us that you're really from Isoko? Because quite a number of people uh, are from somewhere in Nigeria, but they can't speak the language. I mm. know Gaga. This woman is very beautiful. Interesting. So that word itself, <laughs> 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 the way you have said it, you know, it suggests that yes. I won't respond, uh, so don't. No, you're not expected to. <laughs> <laughs> That's not to embarrass you a little bit. You know, that, uh. Okay, so you're from Isoko? Yes. I'm a village boy. I always tell people I'm a village boy. You know, I, I did my primary school all at home. Um, my uncle who raised me from the creep wanted me to attend the federal government college. So after I had finished primary school in my mother's hometown, and I hadn't quite made a mark, uh, he suspected that because I'm my mother's only son and the last child, so he was, she was uh, doting on me. So he yanked me off, parceled me off to one of those, the many that he had raised. He was a famous, you know, uh, well, I mean, I won't say philanthropy, but a pillar of the community, you know. And he had, many had passed through him, you know, some become teachers and various stations. And he parceled me off to one such, a distant cousin who was a teacher at Ideze Primary School, and to repeat Primary 6. So I actually repeated Primary 6 in Ideze, and obviously he was right, because it was while I was there, I wrote the common entrance again, and this time I was invited for an interview at Federal Government College, Wari, and I had done the interview and passed it before I got another invitation to Government College, Ugeli, which was one of the other schools he said I, would, I had to attend, either Federal Government College or Government College, Ugeli. But by that time, there was no need for me, you know, to go do that interview. Then from Federal Government College, Worry, that was where I developed my interest in writing to start with. I didn't have a battle with him. He was a scientist, you know, maths and physics, took himself off on the strength of his uh, uh, abilities in maths alone to Fura Bay College and added fixes to it and became a surveyor. So he thought anybody who put their mind to it could do anything. So he wanted me to be a scientist. But of course, that wasn't uh, for me. So in the end, he said, well, grammar won't feed you. But if you must speak grammar, you have to take a profession. You study law. After that, you can do whatever else you want. So I left the Federal Government College worry for the University of Benin, uh, read law, 
And after all these years, I, like I said earlier, human rights, and said, okay, now it's time to fulfill that other part of the bargain, which is after law, you can do whatever it is you, know, you want. So mm -hmm. law wasn't your, wasn't your choice? It, it was imposed in, on you? In the end, in the end, it was my choice. In the end, it was my choice because, first of all, that was where I could put all my interest in literature and the humanities. I mean, I didn't know the word humanities as what described that field of study, but that was where I could put all of that, you know, to use. So I agree with him. It was a, uh, we were both agreed on that. However, having uh, begun writing in secondary school, we used to have a festival of arts and culture every year at Federal Government College Warri then. And uh, there were four houses. Among the four houses, there would be a competition in the various arts, uh, literary debate among the houses, poetry competition, dance, and then drama. So I, one evening in uh, the dining room, uh, the sixth farmer at my table just turns to me and says, well, you have a bent to the arts, isn't it? I said, yes. Why don't you write a poem for our house for the poetry event? I had ever written a poem before then. I did ever even strung two words together by way of a poem. But it was a challenge, and I thought of it, why not? So I thought of the adage, it's an ill wind that blows no one any good, and decided to write a poem on it. It won the first prize for my house. I was required to recite it in the assembly hall before the entire school assembled, and which probably is the biggest audience I've had for a poem, <laughs> which is not bad for a starter, you know. And I didn't look back after that. I, I think uh, my interest was stoked, and I just kept following it. Uh, okay, so a law you were a lawyer, you were a poet, and you are a writer. Which one of them comes to you naturally the most? I, I probably would say being a writer, and that is because being a writer is literally a follow-up to being a reader. I've always loved reading. And it gets to a point where you read and read and you feel, I wish I had written that. I wish I could write like that. And from there, from emulation, you begin to find your voice and then and on and on and it keeps going on and on. But and then in addition, I've always liked argument. I've always loved argument. I love an issue and then both sides, you know, are really going at it, you know, trying to persuade. In other words, rhetoric, persuasion. I love that, you know. So, and all of that you can find in literature, in philosophy, in the humanities. So I would say that comes more naturally. But then, it's not separate from law, because that's exactly what you do. You're dealing, you're dealing with words, you're dealing with language. The lawyer, the good lawyer, is a person that really understands how, because everything is in language, everything is in law, it's in words. You so know, we're talking about know. interpretation. Interpretation. Okay. You know. It used to be in the old school of study, we call it hermeneutics, where it was applied mostly to biblical exegesis, you mm. know, and, and so on. So I don't see the two being really separate. Separate. Maybe what I've not done is the active practice of law, but the discipline, the the way of thinking, the structure of reasoning, you know, that comes from critical analysis, you know. It's at home, but in law and in literature and writing. Okay, for young ones who are coming up and probably under the influence of this program and probably have this um, um, maybe ambition of becoming a poet, what does it really take, you know, to be a, an accomplished poet? Well, first of all, that's then giving me the compliment that I'm an accomplished poet. If that's the case, thank you very you much. You can shake your head. But, <laughs> but, but the, really, like in everything in life, I think it takes, it, it takes application. Let me probably use that, let me use that word, application. You have to apply yourself to whatever you've chosen to do. It may seem easy. Take writing, for instance. A lot of people would think, oh, it's easy to write. I can read, I can write, I can spell. I can put a sentence together, but it's not that easy to put the right word in the right place, to uh, tease out, to have the argument, what you want to say, the point of view, and state it clearly, and marshal the arguments that will persuade people to either agree with you or to say, well, I may not agree, but I see the point and engage you. It's not as easy as most people think. Uh, actually, until I went to Cornell, and uh, 
because I couldn't have afforded uh, an Ivy League, you know, fees, you know, in the U.S. I couldn't, no way on earth. But I got a scholarship. So the way you earn the scholarship is to be a TA. In the process of teaching, writing, I realized that even though I've been writing for a while before I had gone, I published my first book of poems. I had done a number of columns. You know, I was quite um, you know, present in the op-ed pages. I realized that there were still a few things to learn. For instance, I had it even learned about a book, one small book that you could put in your back pocket, you know, mm, called pocket Elements book. of Style mm. by Strunk and White. I hadn't even seen that book before until I got to Cornell. And I got there and I read this small book and I realized that, of course, there was something I was already doing right, but there were a number of things I hadn't quite been doing and hadn't got to, which at the same time are important to writing. Now, you had to mark the word style. It goes beyond uh, the punctuation, the word level, to the sentence level, to transition, to even the way you sound, what defines your voice, and what we call a matter of the ear. That you, it's not as if we don't understand what the person is saying. It's not as if grammatically it is not right, it's not correct, but that in terms of style, it lacks style. There's something missing. Hmm. So all these are things that we come to you in time, and it comes through voracious reading. It is not, oh, I was in primary, uh, secondary school and we read uh, Things All Apart and we read uh, Walesha Inka's Abiku and, uh, and also uh, J.P. Clark's Abiku. No, it's not just what's on the curriculum that you read if you're going to be a writer. You're going to have to read way beyond that. And in that process, cultivate yourself, cultivate your voice and sharpen your literary appreciation and your antenna will always be tuned towards the right word, the right place. So some of the things uh, any poet should take into cognizance is arrangement of words, mm -hmm. the meanings, and then you read them yeah. as well. Yeah, they are, the, they are the technical things. I mean, if you want to go the old school of uh, scansion, meter, you know, uh, rhyme, and so on. Yes, all, this, all, all of but that. That's very there. tasking. Huh? All of that is there. Yeah, it's tasking. And, and I think part of the problem is that a lot of people just think, oh, well, Poetry doesn't rhyme these days, you know, so free verse, you know. But free verse has its own discipline. When you sacrifice one thing, what is the thing with which you're going to compensate? Replace with it. You know. When you break one rule of writing, because all the rules are there, all right, but when you have mastered them, then you can break them. But when you break them, there is a gain, there's something you add of value. When you haven't mastered it and you break, you're just being an iconoclast for no reason, you're just, you're just breaking things, you know, you're just being a vandal literally. You know. So it, it comes from the mastery and you will know when you can get away with it mm. because you've read a lot and really the best school is reading. The Irish poet uh, William Butler Yeats uh, has one poem. Uh, when I teach my class, I, I, my writing class, I always commend those, that epigra epigraph I took from it to them, from his poem Ego Dominus Tus, you know, where he said, why I should uh, turn away from the light, from the burning lamp, and trace its characters upon the sand. Good style is found in sedentary toil and by the imitation of past masters, hmm. of great masters. I'm sorry. So, you you really have to toil at it. That's the bottom line. To become a good writer, whether as a poet, or a novelist, or even a columnist, you know, creative nonfiction writer, you have to toil at it. Okay, um, for doctors, the role they play in society is to heal people and then diagnose and all, lawyers to interpret the law, and um, different professions have their own discipline and their own responsibility in society. For a poet, what role is it that the poet play in societal growth and development and advancement, if we'll add that to it? In short, what is the role of the artist? Because the poet is an artist. The sculptor is an artist. You know, the basket so we, weaver we, we is an artist. We are particularly yeah. talking about the poet. Yeah. Okay, but the poet is a, uh, a user of words. But I don't know that, okay, that will really do it. The poet, I, I, the reason why I'm being hesitant is that I am one of those who shy away from ascribing big societal roles to artists. 
I think the artist, by merely being an artist, creates value. And that's why I was trying to extend it to say the sculptor, the painter, and so on. Now, if you go to the Sistine Chapel, you see all those wonderful paintings. Of what use are they? What was the role of uh, Michelangelo, you know? Would you say it's useless? I mean, you admire it, you marvel at it, but what, in terms of how we live our lives, how does it affect the price of bread? How does it affect how I'm able to pay my rent? Same way with the poet. But the poet has beauty to language. Maybe that's what I, yeah, that's now, now I've gripped my way to it. Poet has beauty to language. Poets are the custodians of language. Um, it's a little bit unfortunate that for post colonial societies or societies formerly colonized, you would say they become. Uh, they, uh, they add beauty to, la of to a foreign language. Because when we want to claim ownership and feel a certain pride in the way the poet functions in society, that, that is a poet that advances our language. That is a poet that takes our language to a different height, gives us new ways, new, adds new meanings to words that we already know, uh, and uh, even maybe gives us words that we had not you know, thought of before. So they are creators, and their medium just happens to be language. Poetry, in the most, it's like song too, like music. What is use is music, uh, especially if you want to say instrumental music that doesn't even have words, no vocals. Say classical music uh, that is non-operatic, you know, and, uh, and 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 doesn't uh, no choral, you know, and doesn't have words. Of what is is it? But we hear it. And we're captivated immediately by it. And it delights us. It gives us pleasure. So, and that beauty is a value that we cannot try to assess in material sense, in a material sense. The way we want to uh, assess the value of bread or the value of a motorcycle, we can't approach what artists, poets in particular, do in that sense. But just to bring it home, in the old definition of poet, it's not only the person who writes verse. The old definition of poet is creator. That's what it actually means, creator. It's creative activity. All right, uh, that's how far we can go tonight on Saturday night. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you on Saturday Same night. Same here.